Okay, so we've looked at bacteria structure and function. We looked at bacterial growth. And now we're going to move on to bacterial diseases. So obviously this is highly important for pharmacists for us to know the pathology of the disease and the symptoms and then the management. So we're not going to be looking at every single bacterial disease because there's far too many. So we picked a few clinically significant examples which we'll talk through. And obviously we would expect you to know these coming to the exams. So there are several learning outcomes to this lecture. So first of all, you should be able to describe the significance of microbes to humans, okay, why they're important to us, and the importance of the normal micro microflora in our body. And then we're going to look at the different microflora in different parts of the body, see how the bacteria differs from, for example, the GI tract, the skin, etc. And then we're going to talk about some major bacterial diseases, as I said, a few key examples and their pathogenesis, their symptoms and their management. And then we're going to just touch on the basics related to antibiotics and how they work. So this will be, you know, fairly brief and you'll just We'll discuss this more later on in the course, but this is just an introduction to antibiotics for you. So to start us off, it's important to know that microbes, including bacteria, are everywhere around us, on our body, in our body. They're on the surfaces that we touch, they're on our clothes, they're in the air that we breathe and in our food and water. OK, so they're everywhere. We can't escape them. And we've actually learned that humans can't live without microbes. You know, we're hosts of microbes living together and we evolve together. And the word microbiome or microflora can be used to describe all the microbes present on the surface of our body and inside our body. And there's no single healthy micro microbiome. So every person has their own unique collection of microorganisms, okay, based on their environment, their diet, medication, events have happened through their life. Okay, so we all have our own unique microbiome or microflora. So most micro microbes aren't harmful and a lot are even beneficial. For example, you know, some of the bacteria in our body, for example, gut bacteria. But some microbes, such as certain bacteria, can cause disease and even cause life-threatening illness. And although we're talking about bacteria today, obviously serious illness can be caused by other microorganisms such as vi viruses, fungi and protozoans, which we'll look at in further lectures. So when someone is infected with a harmful pathogen, it's really important that they're treated promptly with the correct treatment. For example, with bacteria, it's important that the patient gets the appropriate antibiotic, one with the correct spectrum of activity to kill that particular species of bacteria. bacteria. And as well as getting the right treatment, it's highly important to reduce the risk of transmission to other people when we're talking about infectious disease. Okay, it's very important, as you've all gathered probably from the, the COVID situation we're in now. So certain measures may need to be put in place, for example, by doctors or nurses treating the patient, such as masks, gloves, gloves, frequent hand washing. If it's very contagious disease, the patient may need to be isolated. But as we said, most microbes living on or in our body do not cause any issues under normal circumstances. But however, they may infect or invade when conditions are favourable. For example, some people have, we touched on this in, the, in a previous lecture, some people have Clostridium difficile present in their normal gut microflora. And when they're healthy, it doesn't cause a problem. However, if they're taking antibiotics for a long period of time, or the person has a compromised immune system, 
then the bacteria is able to overgrow. And when it overgrows, it becomes a problem because it causes diarrhea and inflammation of the bowel. And this can even lead to perforation of the bowel and death in extreme circumstances. Another example is Staphylococcus aureus, which is normally found in the nose. So in hospitals, on surgical wards, these can cause serious wound infections if somehow the bacteria from the nose gets into the surgical wound. Okay. So we do have an incredibly large amount of microbes, mostly bacteria, on and in our body. And interestingly, in fact, the average adult carries about three times more microbial cells than human cells. And there are two types of microbes, microflora, so resident and transient. So the resident microflora, these, these live permanently in the body and cannot be removed. And these are beneficial as they prevent the colonization of other bacteria, which could potentially be harmful. Then you can also get transient micro, microflora, which varies from time to time without living permanently in the body. But it's important to note that in a healthy human, internal tissues are usually free of microbes. So by internal tissues, we're talking about the brain, the blood, cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so these internal tissues are usually free of microbes. However, surface tissues such as skin, and that includes mucous membranes, are constantly in contact with the environment and are colonized by various microbes. And just for your information, the mucous membranes line many tracts and structures of the body. For example, the respiratory tr tract, the GI tract, so the gastrointestinal tract, and the genitourinary tract. So first of all, we'll look at the normal microflora in the skin. So the skin surface can be divided into three environmental niches. So dry, moist, and spacious. Spacious means containing sebum, which is like an oily, waxy substance. In general, bacterial diversity is greatest at dry sites. So the forearm, buttocks, and hands harboring a mixture of different gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Moist areas, on the other hand, such as the endoderm area, exhibit less diversity of bacteria. Staphylococcus species are found here. And then the skin surfaces with the lowest bacterial diversity are the oily spacious areas, so the forehead, behind the ears, and the back. And this is where the cutie bacterium species are found, and these bacteria have been linked to acne. Most skin bacteria are found on superficial cells colonizing dead cells are closely associated with the oil and sweat glands and the secretions from these glands provide the nutrients for the resident bacteria such as S. epidermidis. And then if we look at the nails, the microbiology of a normal nail is generally similar to that of skin. You can get dust particles and other materials trapped under the nail depending on what the nail has come into contact with. And in addition to the resident skin and flora, these dust particles may carry fungi and bacilli. And if we look a little bit at the microflora in the conjunctiva, so at birth and throughout human life, a small number of bacteria are found in the conjunctiva of the eye. So the conjunctiva is like a delicate membrane lining the eyelid and covering the eyeball. So the eye has several defences to actually protect it against infection, including the lysozyme in tears, which helps to eliminate microbes, and also tears, which physically remove the microbes from the eyes.